terrorists named governors, senators, presidency officials and sponsors during interrogation, says naval officer. And for the Anambra state elections, insecurity might not just be a problem as much as voter apathy would be. Well, this is according to Yaga Africa. This is Plus Politics and I am Mary Anna Cohn. A former naval officer, Commodore Kunle Olaomi, has stated that Boko Haram terrorists mentioned names of current governors, senators and Asso Rock officials as sponsors during interrogation by military authorities. He, however, said that President Muhammad Buhari's government failed to demonstrate the necessary political will to go after the high-profile politicians for reasons best known to it. Olaomi, who disclosed this during a television interview, also described Tuesday's attack by bandits on Nigerian Defense Academy as an aberration. He lamented that NDA, like other military environments in the country, carelessly opens its doors to everyone on Fridays for Juma prayers. Well, joining us to discuss this and more is Hassan Stan Labo. He is a retired military officer. Thank you very much for joining us, sir. Uh, thank you very much, please. Now, yesterday I spoke to two retired arm, um, army officials and uh, the impression they gave me was more like they agreed with the fact that um, there are actually um, high up politicians who are colluding, who are sponsoring uh, terrorism in the country. And, and But the question that was on my mind continuously is, shouldn't these people be investigated? Why are we keeping quiet about this when we're having so many people killed on a daily? Yeah, thank you, Mary Ann. I appreciate you bringing me here this evening. Um, the question you have just asked is the same question every patriotic Nigerian is asking. I'm beginning to wonder <laughs> what sort of a government we have in place. Rather than investigating these guys, we are, or let me say our government is busy creating excuses for them. Okay? Today we find them serving at every level, at a strategic level. Okay? They are there in the cabinet and so on. Uh, Pantani's name has been, has, been, has, been, has, been, uh, uh, has been on air for as long as we can all think of. Uh, in, in, in better climes or in places where you have very serious leaders in place, Pantani wouldn't be, still be sitting on the cabinet. It is unfortunate. And we have several Pantamis out there. Several. So I wonder if really we are, we are, we are, we are, we are serious about fighting terrorism in this country. But this is oh, not, we're just merely paying lip service. But this is not new because I'd like to refer you to the Good Luck Jonathan administration. If you remember vividly during the at the peak of Boko Haram attacks, remember the president himself said that there were he was aware that there were certain people sponsoring Boko Haram in his government. And then, of course, the average person would be hoping that these people will be named and and shamed and, of course, dealt with uh, properly. Uh, and that didn't happen. So I'm really wondering, so why are we so surprised that this government, even though it promised to fight corruption, has not done the same? It's a reflection of the character our leadership is made of. Not just this one, even the past one too. It's just that things have gotten worse under this present administration. We thought uh, governance had gone to sleep under the last dispensation. But in this dispensation, governance is completely in a state of coma. So it is just the, the, a reflection of the character of our leader. So I'm, I'm asking you as someone who's served this country, someone who's tried to bring peace to the borders and the territory in itself, you've given at least... 30 plus years of your life to serving this country. How does it make you feel when we continuously talk uh, about the issue of fighting terrorism? We pay a lot of lip service to it, but then we, you never get to see action. Uh, many blame the army, um, and many have even accused the army of having moles within it. 
Um, some also blame the government um, because the army takes its orders, you know, from the government. Um, the, the chief of army staff obviously reports to Mr. President, who is the commander in chief. But as someone who's fought for this country, do you think they were re really ready to fight terrorism and put an end to it? The army is completely answerable to political leadership. The armed forces of this country is fully subjected to the dictates of the political leadership. So if there is any blame, it first must rub off on the political leadership before it falls on the armed forces. Mind you, this is a democracy. So that is it. But are we really... It is unfortunate. Uh, so are we really yes. ready to fight terrorism and put an end to it? Because the president has been talking tough. We, we remember a few months ago when... Uh, the presidency declared, you know, a no-fly zone, uh, shoot at sight. There was some talking tough. Um, we also remember the, what led to the Twitter ban, the fact that Mr. President's tweet was taken down. People had been saying that the president had not been speaking, and then he decided to talk, uh, and that led us to where we are today with the Twitter ban and other issues. Um, so is talking tough enough? I'm, I'm still rephrasing my question again. Is it enough? What else do we need to do to really show that this fight against terrorism is something that we really want? And are we making it a front burner issue as we should? You can't be talking tough and your body language is saying something else. You can't be talking tough and still be seeing every development in the field or within the battle space from a prism of ethnicity, religion, tribalism, and what have you. You can't be tech talking tough that way. If you want to be a leader, you be a leader. And as a leader, you see everything objectively. You don't allow your sense of reasoning to be broad by all those sentiments I have just mentioned. Tribe, in fact, all the very, uh, what do I say now, the, 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 the very elements that create weaknesses within our system, religion, tribe, uh, ethnicity, and what are you? If you want to talk tough, talk tough and follow it through. You don't talk tough today and tomorrow you are defending Pantani. You don't talk tough today and people are telling you, Mr. A, B, C, D, like Kule mentioned in his, uh, like uh, Commodore Kule, uh, or like Kule mentioned in his, in his in his uh, interview, okay, that look, government is aware of some of these guys. How many of them have you been able to pick out? You don't just talk tough within an empty space. When you talk tough, you follow it through. By so doing, you now give your subordinates, okay, the belief and confidence that yes, we have to follow through. Look, there's a lot wrong with this administration. So much. And some of us are just tired of talking. Our prayer is, it has spent its time already. Let's just wait for the remaining two years or thereabouts and let them go. And let's see if the next man coming in will be somebody who can run this country. But as much as, as, as much as I feel your pain and distress, I feel the distress in your voice, uh, it also seems like we're part of the problem when we throw our hands up in the air and toss in the towel, hoping that, you know, two years will fly by. At the expense of how many people who are dying, I mean, do you see the death toll? Or have we also become very thick-skinned against, uh, you know, the numbers? Because now we just hear that 100 have been killed, 500 died. We really, they're now just numbers to us and we no longer value it. And maybe that's why... Someone like you would say, oh, well, well, let their time pass so someone else will come. But how many more people have to die for that to happen? Um, if you are talking about how many people still, will still have to die, or shall we keep waiting while people are dying, I am in a better position to talk about that. Well, because I am from a highly vulnerable area. I am from Southern Kaduna, where the genocide we talk about in Nigeria is currently ongoing. As we speak, as we speak on a daily basis, I lose I, I lose relations. As we speak on daily basis in Lagos, I receive news. I weep or tears drop down my cheeks at times as I go to bed. I feel the pain, but what can I do? It's a democracy. 
the man cannot get out of there until his channel is over. We don't belong to an environment where if the criticism is too much, the man could throw in the toilet and say, well, I resign. Let someone else come in. No, we are not made of such stuff. So he keeps hanging on there. Otherwise, after the first turn off, ordinarily he would have known that. Look, this thing is beyond me. I'm curious. Actually, he would have known. So he has gone on again into the second uh, turn or segment of his entire life. And here we are. What can we do? It's a democracy. There is no other way of pulling other than waiting, other than through the ballot box. So out of frustration, we say, well, we look up to the hills from where it's coming to our help. Our help coming from nowhere, other than from the almighty God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. Well, if we it have, if, if we already have God, if we, if we are all looking towards God, why do we need a government? Because I'm sorry, I, as much as I, I respect religion and all of that, I do not understand why we elect people to lead us. We have soldiers, we have police officers, we have the rank and file. We should probably not have that if we're all hoping on God to protect us. But God cannot come down to do the things that you're supposed to do as a government, as security operatives. So I do not buy it. I'm sorry if I do not buy into this. Oh, well, we'll just hope that God will help us. If we have leaders that are not being accountable to us, who cannot protect us, who cannot live up to the oaths and the promises that they made to, before they got into office, why do we still keep them there? Maybe we're the problem because we, if we're always, you know, hoping upon hope instead of doing what we need to do to get those leaders out if they're not performing. Mary, like I said, this is a democracy. Do you have a, a House of Assembly that can impeach the president? Let's talk reality here and possibilities. Do you have a national... Uh, House of Assembly that can impeach the president. I'm asking. But what, we what, have that. but, but are we are we a people who can also uh, make sure that those members of our national assemblies are, are accountable to us? Can we follow through to make sure that if they cannot do what we want them to do, we can get them out of there? Uh, do we are we even ready to have this conversation? <laughs> are we ready to have it? <laughs> My sister, you live in this country. This is the same House of Assembly or National Assembly that has been tinkling all along with the, with the, with the, with the what's it called, uh, the rules of the game as far as the electoral laws are concerned. And we are all aware of what's been going on in the House of Plate, whether results to be transmitted from certain points to where it's got to be collected or not, and so on. And you saw the, 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 the the sharing, I don't know how to put it, but you, you saw all what went on. At the end of the day, was it reflecting the wish of Nigerians? We have a house that is just dancing to the tone of the executive, period. And that is why I am telling you that we have no option. Other, I don't believe in coup. I don't believe in coup. Even when I was in the village, I never believed in coup. Talk of now that I'm a Democrat. I never, I don't believe in coup. And this is a democratic dispensation. So the only way we can throw out the president and his party is through the ballot box. Or we impeach him. We do not have a house that can impeach him. They lack what it takes to impeach him. They lack the gods. The envoys, like the Americans would say. So what do you do? Other than look at your wristwatch and look up to the heavens, the way your head come. Let's not talk as if we can do anything beyond it. All we continue to do, like a lot of other executives, I'm happy you are where governors are busy telling their citizens to take their personal security into their hands. Because, invariably, those governors are telling you, you have no government that can protect you. So, so under such a situation, what do you do? So... I was one of the first voice telling Nigeria to take their security, you know, take ownership of their personal security. Everybody shouted to her level. Eh? Today, even governors are saying it. What is left is for the president to tell us, my fellow Nigerians, take your personal security, take ownership of your personal security. I cannot protect you. That is the only one we are waiting for here. 
Otherwise, we have had it from every other governor. His ministers have said it. Governors have said it. We all live in this country. So the frustration has gotten to a point where you have no other option than to say, well, I look up to the heavens. For whence come at my help? <laughs> because I have no government. I have no government. Let's talk. Let's let's talk. <laughs> let's talk. Uh, let's talk about other issues because I I don't know if it sits well with me every time you say you look up to the heavens and I'm not a hater of religion in any way, um, but let's look at this issue of the NDA. I mean, a lot of your colleagues have been speaking. Uh, there's been like a, an uproar from the um, retired military officers, and a couple of them have been quoted in our national dailies. Um, I'd like to, you know, talk about some of them who have said that this, the attack on the NDA uh, is a national embarrassment. Um, but then I have spoken to people who have also worked with the military who said um, that the NDA is not as secured as it should be, uh, as, as a cantonment or a barrack would be secured. Uh, and, and, and that's why maybe it was a soft target. But do you think that this hit on the NDA was some sort of message sent to the country or to the military or to the government. Again, as we speak, there are reports that um, a certain university, if I'm not mistaken, um, the College of Technical Education in Gusau, um, the provost was, uh, received a letter, a threat letter from bandits. And, and it makes me ask the question, the fact that these people are undeterred, they, they seem fearless. Uh, could it also be that maybe they have seen some level of weakness coming from our leaders or maybe our military? What could be fueling this temerity that they, they seem to, you know, show off? Mary, I will say this on air. Two major factors continue to mitigate every effort of ours in the course of we trying to see how we deter the, 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 the threats on ground. One, government is complicit. I am saying it. Government in this country is complicit. How are they complicit? Do you have facts? Because, because in Nigeria is concerned. How, how do you and by know? that, I mean that. I'm sorry. How do you know that government is complicit? How do you know Please, this? Let's because just because time. we I'm are explaining. hearing, let's we're not sure. Time. Let's just save time. I'm explaining. By them being complicit, I mean that government, to a greater extent, knows all what is happening. And they cannot claim they do not know. Both at the national and supranational level. Okay? We have a government who cannot protect our air, space. And so, as far as I'm concerned, unidentified flying objects move into the forest, come down, drop logistics to terrorists, terrorists whom government have, have branded bandits, and flies off. Are we saying Nigeria lacks the necessary capabilities to know which aircrafts are those ones, where they are coming from, of whose authority, and so on? That same government lacks what it takes to protect our borderlines. We closed or shut down our borders for nearly two or three years here. And that was the period when we had the greatest influx of foreign Fulanis into our country, creating all the havoc we have around. Our government could not also protect our land space. And you want me to believe that? That we lack the capability to protect our airspace, to protect our land space? Our maritime environment has been taken over by, 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 by all these, uh, what do they call them? On the high sea. We cannot also protect our maritime environment. Then what sort of a government do we have in place? With all the instruments of coercion at its disposal? The army, the air force, the navy, the customs, the immigration, the police. Then we have no government. What is our sovereignty then? But, uh, but, uh, then that same government cannot protect us as citizens? 
in this country? Today, every Nigerian walking on the street has to keep looking back as if you are a thief. Because you, 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 you do not know from where the next problem will be emerging from. We have all become Lily, li, li, oh God, oh, oh. I can't believe Nigeria can be reduced to this level. Hmm. I'm, 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 I'm just wondering, um, the issue of manpower, because people have also mentioned that the army is I just mentioned the one. The uh, second one, I told you there are two issues. Okay. I have just mentioned, talked about government's complicity. Complicity, as far as the situation is concerned. The second one has to do with the issue of moles. There are moles at every level, well known to the government. Until we have a government that is hell bent on fighting terrorism, we can never do away with this. Until we have a government that is sincere and ready to be objective in a strategy and whatever. We can never get out of this. Uh, within the last 24 or 48 hours, you've had all the revolutions coming now. How individuals are saying government is aware of this, government is aware of that. Well, I'd like to throw in I'd like to quickly throw in that the DSS, which is which works directly under Mr. President, has claimed that they have information on these so-called sponsors of terrorism in the country. But they cannot act. In other words, their hands are tied until Mr. President gives a go-ahead. Are we not saying the same thing? We are saying the same thing. What is depriving Mr. President from giving the go-ahead? What is stopping him? We are not serious. We are yet to be serious. Until this country is turned into some Afghanistan, we shall not be serious. And gradually we are tilting towards that. So, Gradually, we are tilting towards that. So, so what do we do as a people? Because <laughs> all we've been saying is government hasn't done this, government hasn't done that. And I'm not in any way holding brief for the government or saying that the government has done enough. I mean, I remember, if not a few months ago, when the, gov the president was addressing um, INEC officials, I, I remember vividly he said he's tried his best and he asked a question that continues to... Uh, you know, replay in my head. That what more? What more can he do? That was a question that he asked. I, I, I still remember. Um, but again, I'm curious. What part can we play? Because we can't all just. We're 200 plus million people, and the people who govern us are this tiny. The number of people who govern us are f barely a fraction compared to the people who occupy the uh, the office of the citizen of the Federal Republic. We really can't just say that power is only with the government. We are in a democracy, sir, and you have been saying that over and over again. If power does reside with the people, what are we doing with that power? I mean, we cannot keep saying that well, the government has the army, it has the police. Where does our own function and responsibility come in? Because we cannot keep sitting at the fringes and hoping that a miracle is going to happen. So what do we do going forward? For ages, some of us have been turned into FM stations. We keep talking and talking and talking. Our names have become FM stations. We have reeled out all sorts of solutions and so on. The point is that in government, we have nobody who sits down to take notes when some individuals are speaking. You cannot continue to claim you have complete uh, uh, what's it called? Or, uh, overall, you know, answers to all problems beclouding the country. As a government, you must be a listening government. That someone has picked you, or that a group of people have picked you to come out and do a job for government, does not mean that you are the only man who has all the solutions. In better times, when some people are talking on the television, there are individuals who take notes as it relates to their offices. And at the end of the day, they compile these things and forward it to their principal. This is a government where nobody does that. If you are talking, God will show you is more concerned about how he would attack you when you finish talking, rather than listening to you and taking down points. 
and so on. So at the end of the day, the man is not fed with any information. We just come on air, talk and go. Nobody is listening. Nothing is being implemented. No amendments are done to whatever arrangements you have on ground. You continue to fine tune whatever plans you have on ground as new ideas and better ideas or superior arguments have been placed on the table. Nobody is doing that. So how long shall we continue to talk? And the problem with this administration is that we have mistakes in nearly every department. Because in the first place, the recruitment of those who should run some departments or whatever has been based on other religious reasons, ethnicity, tribalism, what have you? But so at the end of the day, you find a bunch of misfits who don't even know their left from their right. But there are those Please, who, there are those who would, who would say that, that the reason why people okay. like you are waxing lyrical is because you're not given opportunities to, you know, uh, be in these very juicy government offices. And that if you were, for example, you, sir, were being given an appointment by the Bahari administration, you'd probably lose your voice. Is that true? Uh, who said that or is it coming from you no no i'm saying that there are those who say that the people who oppose governments this vehemently are those who yeah. obviously are in opposition or are people who want something and if the government were to give you what you want you probably would lose your voice do you agree with that they, they may be correct because of course that is also part of the nigerian character they may be correct but in most cases i will tell you this when there are two categories of people that come on air let me tell you this, my dear. You are like a daughter to me, and I want you to listen attentively. There are two categories of people who come on air to talk. There are those who come to talk as politicians, and maybe the poor within the realm of politicians. All they say is to see how they are able to manage things to go in their own way and make sure they project themselves, eyeing the next elections and so on. The second category are people who are nationalists. People by virtue of their background of training and so on, have grown up to love the country. And when they talk, they don't mince words. They talk straight. They sound objective. Okay? And their concern is for how the Nigerian nation can move forward. And they have, in most cases, paid their dues. I repeat, paid their dues. Okay? I have paid my dues as a Nigerian and as a soldier. I have fought in four different international locations. And I know what I have seen and what I have gone through. I was in Liberia. I was in Syria alone. I was in Darfur as the first commanding officer from Nigeria. And of course, I was in Bakasi for over three years. I have paid my dues. I joined the army at the age of 13 through the Nigerian military school when I knew nothing about money. When I knew nothing about military officers becoming governors, I came out of sheer patriotism from what I saw from my dad, who was a bloody driver in the World War II, and how I saw his uniform sparkling. Wow. And of course, I got moved to protect my, my, the territorial integrity of my country. Some of us have come a long way. When we talk, people listen. Okay. I don't fall within that category. I, I don't. And if you know me very well, you know I don't. And that is why when I talk to leadership, I look into their eyes and tell them the bitter truth. Because if I cannot look at leadership at this age and time with my wealth of experience and tell them the truth, when shall I do it? When am I in my grave? No. Well, um, Hassan Stan Lebo is a retired military officer. Thank you so much for speaking with us. We appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate this. All right. Well, we'll take a short break. Thank you all for staying with us. The show still continues. When we come back, the upcoming Anambra State election uh, might not be affected just by insecurity, as we fear, but by voter apathy. We'll get to find out more after this break. <laughs>